I've known this extraordinary mom for a very long time. As an entertainer, Rosie O'Donnell has made us laugh and has helped redefine family in America. But what I think is most extraordinary about Rosie is how she reaches out to those kids who need her most. It's Rosie! It's Rosie with Weird Earphones. Radio. Hi, everybody. Five days a week, Rosie broadcasts her satellite radio show from her home in Nyack, New York. Surrounded by her longtime staff of producers and a trusted sidekick, Rosie takes phone calls from her listeners and sounds off on whatever's on her mind that morning. Here's what I've come to find out. I don't really like kids. That whole thing was just, no, it was an illusion. No, it was an illusion. I was trying to have an image. I was setting it up. It was just sort of a show, like how Glenn Beck does and all of them. In fact, some of mine I'm giving away. So if you call in right now at 877-94 Rosie, take your pick. She's joking, of course. Despite what she says, Rosie couldn't imagine her life without her kids. I was not one of those kids who grew up thinking, oh, I wonder if I'll have babies. I always wanted to be a mom. I never, ever considered that my life would be one without parenting. I knew I would be a mom. Rosie has four children. The oldest, Parker, is about to go to college. The youngest, Vivian, is in grade school. She first adopted as a single mom. She told the adoption agency she had only one request. I said I would like a girl because I thought, well, you know, I'm gay. I'm probably not going to have a lot of guys around, and it'll be easier. And what if they want to go to the bathroom in the mall? And when they get to be eight, they're not going to want it truly that happened to. And uh, so they called me up and they said, hi, it's uh, the adoption agency. I said, oh, my God, what's her name? It's a boy. And I started to cry. I was thinking, what am I going to do with a boy? How am I going to do What What is this, you know? And uh, it turns out that God doesn't make mistakes. And it was the most healing relationship that ever happened to me. And now he's like six foot tall. And I said, it's taken 48 years for the best looking kid in school to be in love with me. And it was worth the wait, I gotta tell you. Becoming a mom for the first time and feeling the weight of that responsibility made the loss of her own mother at an early age that much more devastating. And when I first held my son, that first night, I had alone with Parker. I remember sobbing and sobbing. It was the first time that I ached for a mother. I remember just feeling I wanted someone there, an older, knowledgeable woman who loved and adored me the way I feel about this child to help me. Rosie's mother died of breast cancer just a few days before Rosie's 11th birthday. When I was a kid, you know, I was one of the only ones in the elementary school who had a dead mother and we were the dead mother family. A few years later, a young teacher became her surrogate mother and helped change her life. Pat Maravell was a teacher who took over mothering me when I was in eighth grade. So I know people can be saved by people who are not related to them because it happened to me. Anyone who loves your kid to me is gonna anchor them to the earth and you never know which rope is gonna be the one that holds them when the rest snap. Pat Maravell inspired Rosie to be that rope for countless other kids. Everyone's asking, yes, of course you keep the shirt. Yeah! Yeah! Rosie's earning power has given her the financial wherewithal to become one of America's most generous philanthropists for kids. In 96, I started a foundation, the For All Kids Foundation, and the first initiative was inner city daycare centers, and we opened, I think, about 30 of them called the Cutie Patootie Centers, and I would always write the check and go to the opening, but I wasn't really hands-on. I didn't get to know the kids' names. I didn't get to really love them back to life the way Pat Maravell loved me back to life. So when my show was over, I said, I would love to have a school, a school where I could teach kids like musical art and theater and help them the way she helped me. That school grew into an organization called Rosie's Broadway Kids. It began as an extracurricular activity for fifth graders in some of New York's most underfunded public schools. And so I had 200 kids, some of their parents, some of the teachers, and they lived in the theater district, but they had never seen a Broadway show. So we went to see Aida, and I'm holding the tickets, and this little kid, Zion, says to me, excuse me, Rosie, where do we sit? And I said, huh, dude, how about those 200 empty seats? And he looked up at me and he said, in the velvet? 
I said, yes, Zion, you are sitting in the velvet. He thought they were going to bring out folding chairs for them. And it broke my heart, you know, and I thought to myself, every kid deserves to sit in the velvet, especially if you grew up in New York, <laughs> at least once. So then I'm like, we need a building. So we bought a townhouse in the theater district and we gutted it and we made a Maribel Art Center. Though she didn't live to see its completion, this state-of-the-art center is named for Rosie's surrogate mom, Pat Maribel. Rosie knows firsthand how crucial the arts can be for kids who don't know where they belong. The arts have been gutted all over the country, and I know for me that was the way out of my childhood, out of a lot of the pain that I was in. I got to live all my emotions in musicals and theater and movies, and I wanted to give that back, so that's what we do. Where I live at, no one does musical theater. No one does singing or anything. Like, I would get teased at school. They'd be like, oh, singing, what's that? Musical theater, what's that? I'm so thankful that I can see that other people do do this. Other teenagers are like me. And Rosie's kids really helped me. They gave me that self-confidence I needed in order to know that I'm not alone. And like, if I want this, I need to pursue it. Yes! For the seven years that Broadway Kids has been in existence, Rosie has been a constant presence as mentor, cheerleader, and coach. Today was great. Do it exactly like that. It was perfect. Did you work on it? You could tell. You can have a bad day at school or whatever, and you come in, Rosie's here, you're like, oh, God, thank you. There's someone to hug. <laughs> like a second mom. That's what she is. This is Daniel. Last year, Daniel had the lead in our summer intensive uh, program. This year, he's got another lead. One day, we're going to see Daniel on Broadway. How old are you? 12, 1, 13. And uh, you think you'll be a performer when you grow up? Hoping to be. Yeah, you're pretty good. Yep. You're very good. Thanks. You're excellent. Daniel Estrella has been with Broadway Kids for seven years. It's been a lifeline to keep him off the streets. With the arts in general, it has really kept me focused. And I see how other kids that I've grown up with have turned out to be. And I ask myself, what if that was me? I feel like with Rosie, she just has to give us a few inspirational and motivational words. And we take it from there and we just like soak it in and just let it pour out in our performance. Tonight, some of Rosie's kids are performing for a group of the center's most important funders. Some of these kids, like Daniel, have been in the program from day one and think of Rosie as their Pat Merrill. Thank you, everybody, for being here. The kids are all ready. They've got amazing uh, gifts, and, and I hope that uh, you enjoy tonight. I know that I will. It's thrilling to see, especially, you know, Daniel, the only minority scholarship to Carnegie Mellon. I'm so proud of that kid, and all of the kids, but him especially, because he was the first group in the first school, and all he wanted was to play the piano, and stood there by the cello, and just like a sponge, soaked in every moment that we uh, had with him. And so, to see him now, about to go off to college, pretty amazing. So uh, please welcome him. Go get him, Tom. It just takes a small act to change a child's life. It doesn't have to be huge, it doesn't have to be profound, you don't have to start a foundation, you don't have to open a school, it's just one kid. It takes one adult to be consistent and to show up to save a kid's life, just one adult who's going to love them and not give up. Coming up, I thought we would all be best friends and get along and there would be no problem. And, you know, then life interfered. Rosie talks candidly about her own kids and how her divorce and new relationships have affected the family.
Rosie lives in Nyack, New York, in a very private compound on the Hudson River. It's here that she's raising her two boys and two girls. Since she's a girl, she always thought raising girls would be easier than raising boys. She was wrong. It is harder to parent girls as teenagers. And all my friends told me this, and I remember thinking, well, how hard could it be? You know? And the truth is, my daughter's 13, it's hard. You know, you gotta stay very close, which instigates a lot of, if she does that to me one more time, it's like, almost I have a reflex, like it's, I just want, like, I've never backhanded them, I've never hit, I, I, I swear I have the instinct to go, right, you know? This is a parent about good mothers. Welcome to the show. Even though I was raised by a feminist, I'm a lesbian, I'm pro-women in every way, I have a double standard when it comes to my son and my daughter. And it shocks me, you know, as a mother. It's something that I want to correct. And a friend of mine said, well, when you have a son, you have to worry about one dick in the neighborhood. When you have a daughter, you have to worry about every dick in the neighborhood. And it's a whole different thing, right? for anyone to see their child become a woman and have sexual feelings, desires, interests, and, and I don't shame her about that. about the fantasy that she has, which is normal for the children, you know, maybe far away, or maybe Miami, that's what she her how to live with all the truths of her existence. And I'm also very, very, very open and honest, probably in hindsight too much, but you know, you can only do what you think you wanted as a child. And there were lots of secrets in my house. So as a result, there are really none. Everything is talked about. Part of being open and having no secrets is that Rosie has always been honest about her sexuality. But that doesn't mean it's always been easy for her kids to accept. In fact, both Parker and Chelsea, at different times in their lives, have had issues with their mom being a lesbian. Everything was about the damn cruise. I started to get a little jealous, a little pissed off. She's like, do you think lesbians like peanuts? How do I know? I said, Chelsea, I'm really sorry that I'm gay, but I can't change it. In the same way that I can't change that I have brown hair, or brown eyes, and she goes, well, you could wear contacts. I said, you know, I could, and a lot of people do because they're ashamed of being gay or they think it's weird or bad, and that's no way to live or to be free. Parker used to say sometimes, you have no idea what it's like to be me. You have no idea what it's like to have a famous gay mother. I said, you're totally right, and you are gonna have to explain it to me in every detail, and I'm gonna do my best to understand because I don't have any idea what that's like. It must be really weird. He's like, yeah, but it's all right. I understand the image. I understand, you know, it's all I wanted when my mother died. I wanted my father to marry Betty Buckley or Julie Andrews. I wanted them to come in and save the day, sing some songs, make some clothes out of curtains, you know, but life is not full of many of those moments. <laughs> <laughs> the kissing monster? Yeah. Me, as great right? a life as Rosie has been able to give her own yeah. children, there's no such thing as a trouble-free family. The kids, the parenting, w without a doubt, the best thing that happened to me. And the most challenging, you know, in ways I had never expected. I thought we would all be best friends and get along and there would be no problem. And you know, then life interfered. 
real life. It's not a movie. For Rosie and her former wife Kelly, real life meant divorce after 13 years. In fact, it was the priority that Rosie put on kids that factored into that breakup. When she met me, I had two. And then, you know, I wanted every two years to get another baby. So we had Blake, and so that was three. And then we had Vivi, and then um, I was ready for the next, but Kelly was not uh, in any way, shape, or form. I mean, divorce is horrible on children. It's almost like a death. They equate it to a death, right? So to try to do everything you can to cushion that blow and to make that reality uh, as painless as you can, knowing that innately it is causing tremendous damage. And you do feel like you're throwing a hand grenade into your kid's bedroom. But what should love teach them? Joy. And if you're not able to show them joy, if you're just showing them well, we're going to survive and stay together because we don't want the emotional truth to be felt. You're doing them a disservice because all, all that matters in life is to have some kind of access to your emotional truth. You hope that you teach children resilience. You hope that you teach children that the only thing that's constant in life is change and that love is not changeable. People have said to me, oh, you're so, how could you adopt four children? It's so amazing. I'm like, they're the ones who saved me. In a way, it was selfish. They're like life preservers. And instead of one, I grabbed four, one for every limb, knowing that I wouldn't go under if they were around. Left to my own devices, I'm not so sure I would have been here. I don't take care of myself the way I take care of them. To be a protective presence is the role of every parent so that they can feel safe and that they belong and that there is a home forever. Tomorrow, tomorrow, I love you. That is the funniest thing.